So if you guys enjoyed the first couple sessions, it's been, been eye-opening for sure. Um, are you going to be okay? I don't know that she can come up here. I'm not sure what's going on over here. Ken, you're going to be in control of this one, I guess. So, Well, Ken and April, Pastor Ken, our Mountain Grove pastor, um, and his lovely bride are going to be the next up, and uh, I think they have a little video to play. said, did you put a fun one in there of us? And I said, yeah, I did. Yeah, I did. You never know. Wow, right? What a special day it is to, to set some time aside to, to go, go and actually look into your marriage about where you need help. And, and sometimes I, I, what I've learned is the fact that a lot of people think that they're the only ones. Right, and and that's not true. Uh, there's no perfect marriages out there, um, and there never will be. Uh, but praise God that God has put it on Pastor D's heart to have a marriage conference, and I think these are important. And uh, my encouragement for you is that you will come in here one way, but you'll leave changed for the better another way. Amen. Amen. Because listen, it's it's important. Uh, the enemy wants nothing more than to still kill and destroy your marriage. Uh, that's what he's after, and he doesn't care what he's got to do to get to that, mm -hmm. and he will use you against each other. So my, right off the bat, I just want to tell you that you, uh, your spouse is not your enemy. Right? The enemy is your enemy. Uh, your spouse is not. And uh, so we're going to, uh, April's going to pray us in, and, and then, then we're going to get started. God, we just come to you, Father, and we just say thank you and amen, Lord, for this day, God, for yet another day, God, to, to get it right, yep. God, to, to work on what we need to work on, Lord, and, and just to glorify you. God, I just thank you for each and every person that is in this place today, God, the, the married couples, Lord, that, that are here, God, that they're not just here, Father, on their own accord, Lord, but you had a divine appointment yeah. for them today, Lord, God, and and they're here, God, investing, Father, in their marriages and in their yeah. relationship with you and their families. Lord, and we just say thank you for that. God, we thank you for what you've done in and through us, Lord, that we get to stand here today, God, and glorify you. Mm -hmm. God, I thank you. Yeah. I am so appreciative, God, of what you've done, of who you are. God, how you turned it around. God, we just love you, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So, you know, we've done a lot of marriage conferences, and it's always a, um, it's always a blessing to be able to come and share what God's done in our life and, and how far he's brought us uh, in such a short amount of time. And uh, so, but the last time we've done a marriage conference, the Lord just put this video in front of me. And so what it is, it's a, it's a love letter. From all of us men to our wives. So, men, you can thank me afterwards uh, for this or before either one. But, uh, men, this, or ladies, this is a, and Brother Shannon is specifically from you too, okay? So, but uh, we have a video. Uh, women, this is to you. This is for encouragement, not condemnation. We don't have a video. You had a video. <laughs>
Amen. Oh my. Now listen, I'm sure uh, from the sounds of it that Brother Shannon has uh, uh, had more times than 36 times. So <laughs> praise the Lord for that. But my challenge for you is, I prayerfully that next year we'll have another marriage conference. So my challenge to you is, I'm listen. I'm just going to be honest and open with you. I want to throw out a number. My goal this year is 200 times. So I By plan the end on of the year? I plan on being the champion. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> that's that's a year, not a week. So. But you but, said. See, but anyway, so <laughs> if if any of y'all out there want to challenge, here's a challenge. I'm going to be the king next year with 200 completions. Amen. We don't get to go around our house naked. That's just an excuse. You heard that. <laughs> that was on the list. So, but anyway. So, but anyway, man, we're just, we're just here. We want to have some fun while we're doing this to glorify God. And, yeah. and uh, so, you know, as, as you begin to do something for so long in your life, you become what? An expert. Right? So we want to start off with some expert marriage advice for you all and and i'm going to start and uh so men if uh you if you come home from work and you find that your wife has not been as productive as she as she could be here's the advice i have for you make her a list an itemized list of things she needs to get them done in order she will see that you have taken notice she will appreciate your time and she will do better (laughs) ladies To make your husband feel needed, simply leave the gas tank on empty so when he goes to work in the morning, he will think of you while he's filling it up and how he is your masculine provider. Men, if you come home and uh, your wife is being difficult and uh, the calm down doesn't work, just simply remind her she's starting to to act just like her mother. (laughs) That would not be a good idea. Okay, <laughs> ladies, <laughs> set your phone background to your husband's picture. That way, when you're having a bad day, you can look at his picture and know that if you can survive that, you can overcome anything. So I got one more, and then oh, we'll, we'll move on. <laughs> you were only supposed to have two. So there's, it was like 2 a.m. Uh, in the morning. This uh, wife, she woke up, realized that her husband was not in bed. And so she gets on, puts her house coat on. She goes downstairs, and, and he's at the kitchen table, and this man is just weeping. And she felt compassion for him. So she went over, and she sat down next to him and said, what is wrong, baby? And, and he began to uh, remind her that, you know, do you remember 20 years ago uh, when we first met She's like, yeah, and she's getting all emotional because he remembered. And, and uh, so he, he goes on, or she goes on and, and, uh, uh, about this, and finally he says, do, do you remember when your dad caught us in the back seat of the car? And she said, yes, and the tears are flowing. And, and he said, do you remember the time where he stuck the shotgun to my face and said either marry her or go to prison? And she's weeping. She said, yes, I do remember that. And He said, today I could have got out. (laughs) Listen, here's the deal. If that's you, if that's you here today, (laughs) these marriage advice, right, is that's a good reason to be here at a marriage conference, right? (laughs) Don't use them. That's the expert marriage advice that we have for you. (laughs) That is expert. uh, (laughs) But don't do that. Uh, If you make it to 20 years, listen, just stay in it anyway. Amen. <laughs> if you make it to Tuesday. Yeah, in it. <laughs> amen. But anyway, so um, here's what I want to tell you before we get into it and get serious about this is the fact that what we're fixing to share with you, uh, we're going to share some uh, pretty deep stuff. And it is not to glorify the past. It is not to glorify the enemy. It is to be open for us to completely be transparent with you about the things we've gone through and what God's done for us in our marriage. Uh, not only has he done this uh, in our marriage, he's done this uh an amazing uh, renovation in us as individuals. So uh, we're going to get started and, and uh, kick it All off. Right. So for those of you who don't know us, we are Ken and April Palm, and we've been married for 30 years um, <laughs> this past April. Uh, but it hasn't always been pretty. Um, we have five biological children and 15 grandchildren. Yes, we are old enough. 
Uh, we live in Kabul. We get to do outreach ministries, and we get to do discipleship homes for men and for women. And just recently, we are now pastoring a renovation church plant in Mountain Grove. Uh, <laughs> so we would like to share a little bit of our testimony and what God has done in hopes that it will help inspire others and, and your marriage and you know, share some marriage tools and advice. Um, our story is going to look a little bit different than the past two that you've heard for sure. It's going to be a little uglier, or a whole lot uglier. Um, but we also hope that you see that if you get God in the center, um, that all things are possible. Okay. Examples set. My mom and biological father divorced when I was a toddler. My mom remarried a couple years later. My bio dad went from one failed marriage to the next due to his promiscuous behaviors. Some would say he was a bit of a gigolo. My grandparents on my mom's side divorced after 40 plus years of marriage due to my grandfather's infidelity with a woman half his age, who he went on to marry and then divorce. My mom and the man I call dad, for all appearances, seemed to have a good marriage, but looking back, what I really saw were secrets kept, lies told, and things being hidden behind closed doors where my parents' marriage was concerned. My parents lived in the world, and our home wasn't a God-centered place. Church was something you did on Sunday when it was convenient or trying to impress a new couple of, or new group of people that my parents had met. My parents separated for a short time when I was young, when I was a young teen. I don't remember why, but I do remember the fits and fights my parents would have. My mom was a control freak, a complainer, and a materialistic. My dad was passive, either sweeping things under the rug or just avoiding things altogether to keep the peace. No real good example of resolving conflict, compromising, or compassion. It was more like ultimatums thrown, silent treatments given, and my mom throwing a fit and slamming things around to prove her point of being angry. They both would voice their opinions, but most generally not to each other in a healthy way. Please know that my parents weren't bad parents. They just weren't good teachers or good example setters. So that's one thing we want to just throw out there, that we're not bashing our parents. No. We're just trying to prove a point by... Um, their struggles, how they came down on us. And, and the same thing was for me that the views and the examples that I had for marriage was, uh, you know, growing up, I don't ever remember hearing the word divorce. Um, you know, my grandparents on my dad's side was married for over 50 years. Same thing with my mom's side. You know, they were, they were married for 50 years. And all of my aunts and all of my uncles, uh, all of those, you know, they never divorced. And I never knew that. I, I didn't know what, uh, I mean, I knew what the word divorce was, but that is something I most certainly never heard. But as I was growing up, uh, I also seen uh, the major fights in my grandparents. I also seen major fights through my aunts and my uncles and my siblings, the older siblings that I had. And, uh, you know, one thing I knew that once I began to get older, I knew for sure that I did not want a marriage like theirs. I knew that. Uh, I, I mean, it was obvious that there was no, uh, no true love, there was no kindness, no compassion, uh, any of that in any of the relationships or marriages that was in my family. Um, my parents was always fighting. I mean, these were the examples that, that I had. Uh, there was never any peace. Uh, I remember as a, as a kid, just, I don't even know how old I was. I was really young, but, but I just knew that my dad was a cheater. I just seen it in him. I'd never seen my dad do anything that he shouldn't have been doing, but it was just something that I seen in my dad and, the way that affected me, uh, it affected me uh, in a very uh, negative way. Um, my parents decided after 44 years to finally get a divorce. And uh, as Trish was talking, the, uh, I was 45 when they got divorced. And the devastation that that caused me at 45 was deep. And uh, to be honest with you, even to this day, I still struggle with with the idea, because that was one thing out of, out of all of my family that I could brag on, that my parents had been married for that long, right? So that, that was very impactful, and I'll get to a little bit more of this here in a minute. Early marriage. I moved out of home when I was 17. I got married and divorced in the same year. Going into my now marriage, my views were skewed, to say the least. I was still very immature in, making, in my thinking and taking responsibility or accountability for myself and my actions. I would, I would rather have lied to save an argument than just face this things head on. Little did I realize I took on my dad's characteristics of sweeping things under the rug 
and do what you have to do to avoid the conflict. This is what we would call generational curses, which can lead to hardships, which we will get to in just a little bit. Matthew 12, 25. Any kingdom that is divided against itself is being laid waste, and no city or house divided against itself will stand. Our marriage didn't have God in the center, but what it did have early in was infidelity, lies, deception, lack of compassion, selfishness, rebellion, done by me, which was emotionally abusive and disrespectful to my husband, and caused him some deep, hurt, deep heart scars. It caused him to feel unloved, unwanted, and most certainly not good enough. It gave him insecurities in me, our marriage, and himself. I took advantage of his love and didn't respect his position as the head of the house. I built resentment toward him and was rebellious every time I felt he was trying to control me. I see now where that was something I carried over stemming from my raising in my parents' marriage. All of this would affect my husband's choices later in our marriage. Our house most certainly was divided. Ephesians 5.22 Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. His body and is himself its Savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. <laughs> what? Submit to my husband? No way. He doesn't deserve that. He's not being the husband I want him to be. I will treat him however I want, and I'll expect him to treat me like a queen. He just needs to go along to get along, like my dad did, right? How dare him try and hold me accountable and tell me what to do? That was my thought process. I didn't have a real understanding of what the Bible was really saying. I was still thinking worldly. I most certainly didn't have my order right. I put my kids above everything, and then it was my own desires. Never taking into real consideration how any of this was destroying my husband as a man, as a partner, and as a leader. When I did start attending church and taking our kids, I still didn't know about putting God in the center or what a real relationship with him was or even looked like. But I kept going and was active in the church, and so were my kids. But we were missing a very important main link, my husband, their dad, the leader of our family. As time went on, things got bad and then got worse. My husband ended up in full-blown addiction. And myself and the kids endured all the hardships and adversity that came with it. This is where I start, started drawing closer to the Lord and learning how to fight and pray for my marriage, my husband, and my family. In, in my mind, I was uh, going to have a marriage that was going to be perfect, uh, that was going to be easy, uh, you know, with complete honesty, uh, loyalty, love, laughter, all of these things and it was going to be simple. Uh, it was just simply going to be amazing. That was my thought process uh, going into marriage. Uh, failing to know and understand with the generational curses that I was, that was hovering over my head that had been uh, imputed into my life, uh, failing to know and understand that my marriage was going to wind up looking just like theirs and worse. Um, you know, at the time, I didn't have an understanding of what a generational curse was. Um, I didn't know what it meant. I just, I'd never heard that phrase until I got saved. Uh, you know, when I started walking with Christ, then I, uh, I learned something. I had learned that I had inherited the junk from many, many generations. And it wasn't just from my parents. It wasn't just from my grandparents. It was from my great-grandparents and all the ones that I'd never met before that was literally handed down from all of those times. And I remember one thing that a dysfunction that my dad had was he ruled with an iron fist. There was no know nothing. I mean, it was his way, the highway, and that was just how there was. And I came into my marriage with that, that same mindset, with that same um, uh, level of anger that my dad had, and that's how he, he operated uh, through that, and that's how I did too. And when I first met April, I literally fell head, head over heels in love with her, and I knew that she was the one. And I remember sitting her down and talking to her, and I was telling her that I needed her to promise me that you'll be honest, you'll be faithful, and you'll always love me. And she went on to make these promises, and um, she did it right off the bat, but that was most certainly not what I got. Right? So it, early on, 
the, I went into this thinking that it was going to be perfect. There was no, uh, uh, nothing of stability in our marriage. Uh, the fighting, the cheating, and, and it, it just, the lies, it, it just went on and on and on. And first of all, I'm going to tell you, I was far from a godly man because I didn't know God. I didn't have God in my life. I didn't even know who he was. And uh, when I, I remember when April and I, as you could tell in those pictures, when we got married, we were literally just kids, having kids, trying to raise those kids and just, just trying to get along uh, to raise a family the best that we knew how. But the examples that um, was shown to us, man, was just not good. So we've been traveling this road for 32 years, and, and uh, we have, I mean, listen, we, in that time, April's definitely seen a lot of horrible times, you know, and, and you know, she's endured uh, physical abuse, uh, emotional abuse, uh, being subject to a major drug addict, and, and literally being forced to live into a life that she didn't want to live in, and, and I was okay with that, right, and, and I, I promised to treat her right, right, I made her promise me, and I promised her, and and I was the guy that was going to protect her through all of these things, but it was me, the ones that was uh, always hurting her. When I first met April, one thing that I did do, uh, I knew that I loved her. I knew that she was the one, and I knew that she, we was going to be together. So when I met April, I literally laid down the drugs, the alcohol, the women, the fighting, that lifestyle that I lived. Why? Because she was worth it. About 10 years into our marriage, I began to lay her down and lay the children down, lay my marriage down. Why? Because I thought the drugs was worth it. And I began to live this life uh, about Ken, and we, we were literally living two separate lives uh, from, all, from all kinds of things. And, I, and in this time, I'd literally lost myself. I turned to what I knew that was good, to hide, to suppress, uh, to, to make me feel less pain. And I turned to drugs and and women and pills, and I, I turned to all of the things of the world and became this vicious, violent man. Uh, that And the, the pain and destruction that I caused in my family was just horrific. And I was okay with all of that. You know, not long into when we began to get into this stuff, I became one of the largest meth dealers. I was, I was that guy. I was so far out in left field that uh, it, it, my marriage was in shambles. There was no loyalty, no honesty, no love, most certainly no faithfulness. And we were falling apart so quickly. And the enemy was winning. The enemy had us right where he wanted us to. And he was literally taking everything from us, including our soul. Early on, uh, April began praying that God would humble me, that God would put me in a place in my life, that he would turn my life over uh, into and, and April was always a journal. She 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 journaled everything. She wrote her prayers and she would literally go to God on my behalf and she would begin to write these prayers and and she's gonna read one. Okay, I'm gonna try and get through this. It'll be fine. <laughs> um, I can literally feel the the desperation as I read back over this. And the funny thing about this is is you know I I had forgotten about this and I was actually looking for something else for something that we were doing and. Um, I come across this, and it, there's a part in here that is just astounds me because I know at that time it wasn't my mindset of what we're doing now today, um, but it just it, it definitely astounds me that this was in there. So um, this was back in 2017, sometime I'm not sure exactly when. Um, so here it goes. Father, we trust in your name, so we call for your help day and night. Lord, you know how I feel every moment when I think of Ken. It hurts to see him being ill physically and mentally from the effects of drugs. Father, I lift Ken up to you and ask for mercy, for you to give his life back and to show Ken that through your mercy and grace, he can live a clean life again. Help Ken hit his rock bottom without harm so the vicious cycle of abuse will stop. Open Ken's heart to the truth and take away the confusion of this world and remove the influence of Satan and his demons that have a stronghold in Ken's life. We acknowledge that some addictions are of human nature, but with some God, we acknowledge that the enemy is trying to destroy a person in a household. Father, please place your loving arms of protection around Ken and surround him with the legion of legion of angels. 
God, I believe the army of heaven is greater than the army of darkness. Father, remove the enablers from Ken's life and remove those who per perpetuate the use of drugs or have influence on his life. Surround Ken with only clean, good, God-fearing people who positively support him, not seeking to drag him down. Father, help Ken to be brave and not give up. Increase his faith and let him know you are here to save him because you have a plan and a purpose for him. You are loving and merciful. This is the part that gets me. Expose Ken to the calling on his life. Place conviction on his heart, not condemnation, and clear a path to correction and healing through your love, forgiveness, and grace. Lord, open Ken's heart, body, and soul to let go of any other addictions that could strengthen the addiction of drugs. Be with him through the process, and while he fights free will, allow him to stay clean. I also pray, Father, that you give me peace that surpasses all understanding as I continue to do my best to deal with this. In Jesus' name. The spiritual battles that we were fighting had nothing to do with flesh and blood. We share this to, with you today because I want to tell you that no matter where you're at in your marriage, that a simple prayer from a broken heart, when you begin to go to the throne room of God and you begin to lift them up to God and make your request known to him, Make him, make, make him known specifically what you want God to do. Remember, it's about what his will is, what he wants them to look like. And, and I remember April bringing a bunch of notebooks to me, and I began to read these prayers, and I just began to weep. Because I just knew in those moments, in her moments of despair and hurt, that she was going to God on my behalf. And through her prayers, God began to move heaven and earth to put in order the things that he needed for us. And I want to tell you today, God will do the same for you. Amen. If you begin to place your hope and your trust into God, God will come in and he will begin to tear down the walls that the enemy has put around you. He will begin to tear down the lies that the enemy began to tell about you. He will begin to, to come in and begin to heal things that, that, listen, that's been done to you long ago. You've got to get to a place where you can cry out to the one that will help you. And I just want to add, you know, well, you go to God in prayer. Well, you're, if, you, if you're fighting a battle, the spiritual battle, anything similar to, to what we, we fought, you know, it's so important to understand that it took me a while. I, God had to put me at my rock bottom because I continued to, I had this desire, this desperate need for this outcome, you know, for Ken and to save his life. And... What I did was, for so long, I kept manipulating the situation, you know, I mean, when I would pray, but I'd pick it back up, and, and I wanted to manipulate so I could get the outcome that I wanted, right? I was trying to, to make it go faster. I was trying to do things to, to get Ken to, to read the Bible or, you know, because I'd, like, leave it open on the table or something, and you know, a highlight, because I knew he was kind of, if I had something laying on the table, he was going to kind of read it to see what I was doing, and... Um, so I would highlight things, you know, in the hopes that he would, that he would read it, you know, and it would just click, you know, and, or maybe he was sleeping and I'd turn on John Hagee and walk out of the room and just let it play real loud so it would like soak into his head while he slept or, you know, leave on worship music, you know, he loved Randy Travis and so when Randy Travis, you know, had the gospel things, you know, I, I would just play them really loud and then it got to the point where, you know, praise God that, you know, he liked Randy Travis so much he actually jacked all my gospel CDs, which was cool, you know, and I'm like, yes, you know, it's working, something, <laughs> but I would try to manipulate, but I had to get to a rock bottom, too, um, where I got out of God's way, and all I did, all I would do, you know, in that moment, once I finally hit my rock bottom, was I would go to God on his behalf, and then I would leave it with God. I would let God fight the battle. I would take my petition to him, you know, like he was my attorney, he was my advocate, and he would take it to the ultimate judge to get the outcome, to get the sentence, right? I mean, it was, yeah, I just want to throw that in there because it's so important that you don't, once you take it to God, when you're, when you're on your knees and you're fighting for your loved ones and, and you're fighting for your marriage and prayer, you know, you can't t pick it back up and, and try to manipulate to get the outcome you want. Right. You have to give it to God and let 
him handle the outcome. Yeah. So, okay, sorry. November 2017, I found, I found myself at my lowest point in a jail cell. And at that time, I didn't know what was fixing to happen in my life. <laughs> I just had no clue. I want to tell you that in 2017, Jesus showed up in my life and he rescued me. Amen. Jesus showed up and he, he, he began to uh, change me and, and uh, not just change me from the outside. God began to change me from the inside. God began to take away all of these things out of my life, and the anger was vanishing. The desire to get high was gone. Uh, you know, just all of these other things that God was doing in my life, he began to empty me out of all of these things, and I began to become a free man, right? It was God, it was, listen, it's all God. And uh, I want to tell you now that we now have a marriage we can brag on. Amen. <laughs> we, we now enjoy each other's company. I want to tell you, there's actually honest love. There's actually faithfulness. Uh, in our marriage, and, and no, we're not perfect. No, <laughs> not at all. We're far from it. But we are growing to a place where, and we're heading in a direction where we're, where we're going to be perfected. Yeah. Right? And it's through Christ. And, and I want to tell you today that we're truly living our best life with Jesus in the middle of it. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Uh, before we get into to this, um, to talk about jogging? No, you go do this. <laughs> okay, yeah, Mike, I'll let me get through this first. All right, so let's talk about some adversities and hardship for a moment. Generational curses is the cumulative effect on a person of things that the generations before them did, believed, or practiced. And the consequences of those generational actions beliefs and sins being passed down. That's generational curses. Not only did our parents and grandparents pass down their junk, their beliefs and sin to us because of the examples they were showing, we too pass down our junk to our children because of our behaviors, worldly thinking, and our sin. Adversity is defined as a state of serious or continued difficulty, opposition, hostility, or hardship, any of those sound familiar in your marriages and in your families? Any of this can lead to mental, emotional, and spiritual hardships, not only in our lives, but especially in our marriages. You see, we didn't show our children a very good example of what marriage should be or what a healthy marriage looks like. And it has caused emotional and spiritual hardships and adversity in their lives and marriages due to accepting certain things, acting certain ways, and believing things that they shouldn't. We have most certainly had our share of mental, emotional, and spiritual hardships and adversities both in our lives and in our marriage. I was waiting just for a second, just to see if something was going to happen. <laughs> I knew you're not going to do it. Proverbs 17:17. 17, 17. A friend loves at all times, and brothers and sisters is born for a time of adversity. First of all, your spouse is your friend, not your enemy. Second, even as married couples, we are still brothers and sisters in Christ. We need to have the mindset that we are married for adversity instead of resenting those hardships. Don't let the brokenness of this world cause us to question our marriages. Instead, let it define our commitment to God and to our spouse. Romans 8.18 I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. So we're going to talk about some marriage applications. Uh, you know, uh, it's easy to think that only other people get divorced. That you know, once we say our vows, that you know, that we are immune to these, to the heartaches and all of those things. Well, in fact, you know, any time that the enemy will have an opportunity to put an obstacle in uh, in your path and uh, adver adversity, all of those things. But uh, as Christians, we know that applying biblical pr principles to our marriage will give us a stronger foundation. You've got to start off with having a foundation. You can go out there and build all you want to, but unless you have that solid foundation upon Jesus, you're literally not going to have anything at the end of it anyway. Uh, we, we have to stop uh, expecting uh, of our marriages and our spouses uh, what God never designed or intended for our marriage anyway. Amen. We've literally got to begin to take those things out and looking for a soulmate, I think one of the other speakers already yeah. talked about this, but that's the problem. Uh, there's not a 
person out there that's your soulmate, that, that soulmate that's going to complete you, that's Jesus. Yeah. When you start finding Jesus and putting him in your life, he will complete your soul. He will be the one to fulfill you. When you start putting your expectations on onto your spouse or to other people in your life, I promise you, they will fail you. <laughs> they will fail you every single time. And so when we start lowering that, and a marriage is a other-centered instead of self-centered, right? When you start looking at other people, your spouse, uh, and, and listen, that's the way God designed it anyway, is to be other-centered. Uh, God created marriage as a loyal partnership between one woman and one man. Uh, marriage is the firmest foundation for building a family. If you're wanting to build a family, build it on, on the foundation of Jesus through a godly marriage by being a godly husband, by being a godly woman. And uh, so what does a godly marriage look like? What the Bible says. Ephesians, Ephesians 5, 21 through 27. Do you have that up there? And be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. Wives, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church. He himself being the savior of the body. But as the church is subject to Christ, so also the wives ought to be to their husbands in everything. Did you turn my page? No. I know. But I wanted to read this too. Wives are instructed to submit to their husbands, and husbands are instructed to love their wives, not submit to them. Submission doesn't mean being obedient as a child would be to a parent. Both husband and wife are equally created in God's image and are heirs together. Again, both husband and wife are equally created in God's image and are heirs together. The type of submission this scripture is talking about is respecting the ultimate leadership of the husband and his responsibility for the health and har harmonious working of the marriage relationship, just like Trish talked about, you know, respecting our husbands. And ladies, I, I'm going to encourage you that after this, you know, conference, you, you really do need to study out what God expects of our husbands, you know, his, his true responsibilities as a husband, as the head of the house. And it will give you a whole new perspective and a whole new respect for your husbands, I promise you. You know, we, we think our husbands should just go to work and, and you know, be the, you know, the provider and, and take care of the yard and, you know, the manly things around the house. But when you really have God in the center and you understand what God expects of our husbands and what it truly means, it's a whole new ballgame. It's a whole new respect level. Husbands do not sanctify their wives or cleanse them from their sin, but they are held to do all they can to promote their wives' holiness, discipling her and being the spiritual leader. Genesis 2.18 mentions God making a man a helper fit for him. Fit for him is not the same as like him. Men understand that your wives are not like you. They are not you. They're not going to talk like you. They're not going to think like you. They're not going to act like you. They're not going to reason like you. They're not going to make the same decisions as you. They have their own opinions. They are their own self. So a wife is not her husband's clone, but rather created and designed to complement him, fit for him. God has made her fit for you, men. Colossians 3.18 again references how wives should align themselves with and respect the leadership of their husbands. Lady, the husbands, according to God's design and standards, have a great responsibility to the marriage. It goes far beyond doing all the household chores like I talked about. 1 Peter 3, 7. Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. Peter's advice to husbands in this verse is more addressing the issue that can arise when the power and leadership go to the head. So I'm going to go back just for a second. Husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to them as a weaker vessel. Not that she can't do things on her own. Not that she can't support herself. She is complimenting you. She is the weaker vessel simply because you are supposed to be the spiritual leader. She shouldn't have to step up into that role. That's the weaker vessel. You are her protector. You are the protector of the home. That's what it means for her to be the weaker vessel. 
She's not weak in that she can't support herself. She's not weak in that she can't take care of them kids. She can't take care of that house, you know. And sometimes that she just can't give you a good right hook. <laughs> we'll get to that in a minute. <laughs> To live in an understanding way doesn't mean submitting to the wife and, and giving into her every hormonal breakdown, that, but focuses more on living in accord with God's will, which includes understanding the needs of the wife, which Trish and Shannon talked about. Men, plainly put, if husbands do not treat their wives in a godly way, the Lord will not pay no heed to your prayers. Lead her into the will of God. Love her with godly correction and sometimes... Just listen without trying to fix it. <laughs> that video really got to me. <clears throat> anyway, moving on. Serving your spouse. Focus on your spouse's uh, strength rather than her weaknesses. Encourage rather than criticize. Pray for your spouse instead of gossiping about them. Yes. Um, learn and live uh, what Christ teaches uh, of relating to your marriage. Um, so some of the other uh, very good attributes about uh, a godly marriage is faithfulness. Faithfulness is loyalty to our spouse, and it is the foundation of trust in our marriage. When loyalty and faithfulness disappear, so does the trust. Mark 10, 9. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. Another attribute of God is honor. As married couples... We are meant to give the highest regard to one another. We show honor in the way that we speak to each other, the way we behave and the way we conduct ourselves both in and out of the home. Romans 12.10, be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. Again, it's a other-centered, not you-centered. Uh, humility, pride and arrogance have no place in a unified marriage. We are meant to be humble and assuming, unassuming. No jumping to the worst-case scenarios uh, or conclusions. Has anybody in here ever been guilty of that one? Uh, Ephesians chapter 4, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Patience. This can be a challenge, especially with the inevitable personality clashes we have with our spouse from time to time. Did we do that? No. 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 <laughs> We're the, past that. <laughs> the Bible urges us to show kindness when we feel irritated to, with one another. You're never irritated with me, are you, honey? Again, I'm past that. <laughs> <laughs> so patience is this. Patience is the endurance to stand firm in the commitment you made to God until you see the victory. So really... What you just need to pray for is endurance. And remember, it's really about the commitment you made to God. And he will give you the victory. Remember, you married for adversity. Refer, refer back to Proverbs 17, 7. <laughs> you Lord married helper. for adversity. Yeah, I got it too. Amen. Amen. Another attribute of God is uh, understanding. It is important for us to try and understand each other, uh, especially when our spouse is hardest to understand. Uh, when having conversations, listen to understand and not listen to respond. Uh, unity. Uh, in, a, in a marriage, husbands and wives need to realize that they are on the same team. We have to realize that. You are not each other's uh, enemy. We've spoke on this three or four times already. Unity doesn't mean you have to agree on everything uh, or have all the same preferences or interests like dis and, and likes and dislikes. Uh, in Colossians chapter 3, 14, it says, And over all these virtues do what? Put on love, which binds them all together in perf perfect unity. It is God's desire for us to discover that marriage is fun, fulfilling, rewarding, and godly. It is our prayer and hope that through, the, through all of that we have shared, you will see that there is, there is hope, and no matter the hardship, that there is a Savior that is stronger than that. And remember, fun, fulfilling, rewarding, and absolutely godly. I'm just reminding you. Yeah, right. Okay. Fun. So. <laughs> fulfilling. <laughs> and I am your reward. 
Pastor D, <laughs> get the anointing oil. We need it. So, you know, just right quick, you know, Pastor Dustin, when he first got up here, he talked about silly fights. So before I wrap this up, I want to share one of our dumbest fights ever. Matter of opinion. So it was after supper, April and I would go to the living room. We're sitting in our recliners. We got the Bibles on our lap. We got the Bibles on our lap. We got the Bibles on our lap, right? Everything's supposed to be going really well. We're sitting there, we're studying, and all of a sudden, I felt the presence of my wife's look. And I just kept focused on the Bible. <laughs> but I felt it, and I knew she was looking at me. You know what I'm talking about, man? And then all of a sudden, she began to come at me with something I was very shocked about telling me something that I had done wrong and I simply looked at her and I said okay it's no big deal I'll never do it again <laughs> she got up wrong answer closed her bible and got halfway between the living room and the kitchen and she stops and she's staring at me and I did not want to look up so what, what happened was I was going to all of these meetings, doing all of these things when I first got saved, and, and I was going to, I mean, so many meetings a week, and, and then some woman oh, man. told her that I was at this meeting, and my wife didn't know I was at a meeting. I'm like, okay, it's no big deal. I can fix that. I'm a fixer. If it's broke, I'll fix it. She gets up, and she tells me that she doesn't want me to fix it, and I'm like, so you're telling me you want me to acknowledge to you that I'm doing wrong, but you don't want me doing nothing about it. You hear me? She wants me to say, I know, you're, no, I know I'm wrong, but not mean to do nothing about it. And I'm like, is this a setup? And for like two or three days, this is what she left me. She said, use your discernment. Yep. And left me with that. Yep. Walked out of the room. Silliest conversation we ever had. Well, you, okay, in my defense, I really just wanted him to listen. Like, I wanted him to acknowledge that he was wrong, okay, that he should have told me. I just wanted him to acknowledge that. I didn't want him to change the fact of going to the, all these men meetings. Yeah, I'm still a little hurt about that. She had um, a nail in her forehead. <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to get it out. <laughs> but he was going to all these I didn't want him to stop those things. I didn't want him to quit doing those things. So really what I wanted him to do was just acknowledge the fact that he, communication, right? Communication, Tara, <laughs> Hayden, yes? That's what I wanted him to acknowledge. So, you know, I mean, since he wasn't getting it, you know, and he just, like, I tried to speak language that he could understand. So as I start to walk out of the room, I just look at him and I say, just use your discernment and walked out. <laughs> and we made it through that. We made it through that. <laughs> Praise God. Hey, uh, Pastor Aiden, I don't know if you can, but um, there's a song online. It's by Joe Stom, S-T-A-M-M. -M. It's called First Saw You. If you can look that up. If you're able to do that, but I, 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 I want, seriously want to wrap this up yes. with some real marriage advice, something that you can uh, leave here with. The first thing I want to tell you is lower your expectations of one another. You don't have to lower your expectation of expecting faithfulness and love and, and all of those things. But what I'm saying is stop expecting that food will be on the table at a certain time. Stop expecting that, that she has nothing going on in her life that, you know, the laundry is going to get lower your expectation of one another and it will truly help you. And the other thing is you will never outgrow a lie. No. You might be growing in other areas, but you will never outgrow a lie that's in your life. I want to encourage you to... Um, Begin to build a relationship by, with honesty and with love and compassion with, through forgiveness and all of these things. And the other thing is, if you have people in your life that is only for you and not for your spouse, get rid of them. They are not your friends. If they're not for you and your spouse and for your marriage, get rid of them. They are not your people. If you're, if You've got to have people in, in your life that is for you. And for your marriage. If you're venting to someone because you're, you and your spouse are having this argument, okay, and, and you're going to somebody, even, even if you think they're godly, and they are co-signing with you and agreeing with you about how bad things are, instead of saying, hey, you know what, let's pray about this and giving you some good godly advice, then they are not your people. Mm -hmm. They are not your people because you need to, when it comes to our marriages, we have to protect that. And if we're going to someone 
even no matter how long we've been friends with them or how much we love them or how much we look up to them, if we're going to someone and they aren't giving you good godly advice and they're not for the two of you because you are a unit, you are one, you are a team. So if they are not for your team, if they're not for your unit, if they're not for that oneness, then they're not your people. They're not who you should be talking to about your marriage. Amen. Amen. Listen, it's, it's, it's the one. Uh, this is for the men and women both. Your spouse is not a mind reader. You know, listen, you can sit there and assume all you want to, but they are not mind readers. So we got to learn to be open and literally like I think it was Trisha said, you've just got to just tell them what you want. And uh, I, this is important. So we've been talking about generational curses, things that, we've, that we uh, begin to live our life on. I'm going to tell you today, if you do not slay the giants in your life, you will leave them for your kids and your grandkids to contend with. It's important that you begin to empty out and take care of business that you have in your life that, you can, that your kids and grandkids will never have to go through. And the other thing is, too, is if you don't allow Christ to heal your wounds, you're going to sit there and bleed all over everybody else that never hurt you. It's important that you begin this, this road to recovery, and it's only through Jesus. Was you able to find that video? Okay, it's no big deal. But anyway, so I want to encourage you guys today to not leave here the same. You're not the only ones that's going through struggles. You're not the only ones. Listen, we're still going through our own. So I want, want to encourage you. Men, grab your wives by the hand. Bring them to the altar. Every single person in this room. Bring them to the, to the altar and begin to pray. Thank you.